If Beale Street Could Talk by James Baldwin. We're starting on page 49. Then he looked over at me. He smiled. A wonderful smile. Come on over here, Tish, he said, and sit down on your daddy's knee. I felt like a princess. I swear I did. He took me in his arms and settled me on his lap and kissed me on the forehead and rubbed his hand at first roughly and then very gently through my hair. You're a good girl, Clementine, he said. I'm proud of you. Don't you forget that. She ain't going to forget it, said Ernestine. I'll whip her butt. But she's pregnant, Mama cried, and took a sip of her cognac, and then we all cracked up. My father's chest shook with laughter. I felt his chest rising and falling between my shoulder blades, and this laughter contained a furious joy, an unspeakable relief. In spite of all that hung above our heads, I was his daughter, all right. I had found someone to love, and I was loved, and he was released and verified. That child in my belly was also, after all, his child, too, for there would have been no Tish if there had been no Joseph. Our laughter in that kitchen, then, was our helpless response to a miracle. That baby was our baby. It was on its way. My father's great hand on my belly held it and warmed it. In spite of all that hung above our heads, that child was promised safety. Love had sent it, spinning out of us, to us. Where that might take us, no one knew. But now my father Joe was ready. In a deadlier and more profound way than his daughters were, this child was the seat of his loins. And no knife could cut him off from life until that child was born. And I almost felt the child feel this. That child which no moment yet... That child which had no movement yet, I almost felt it leap against my father's hand, kicking upward against my ribs. Something in me sang and hummed, and then I felt the deadly morning sickness, and I dropped my head onto my father's shoulder. He held me. It was very silent. The nausea passed. Sharon watched it all, smiling, swinging her foot, thinking ahead. Again, she winked at Ernestine. Shall we? asked Ernestine, rising. Dress for Mrs. Hunt? And we all cracked up again. Look, we got to be nice, said Joseph. We'll be nice, said Ernestine. Lord knows we'll be nice. You raised us right. You just didn't never buy us no clothes, she said to Mama. But Mrs. Hunt now and them sisters, they got wardrobes. Ain't no sense in trying to compete with them, she said despairingly, and sat down. I didn't run no tailor shop, said Joseph, and looked into my eyes and smiled. The very first time Fanny and I made love was strange. It was the strange because we had both seen it coming, that it not exactly the way to put it. We had not seen it coming. Abruptly, it was there, and then we knew it had always been there, waiting we had not seen the moment, but the moment had seen us from a long ways off, sat there waiting for us, utterly free that moment, playing cards, hurling thunderbolts, cracking spines, tremendously waiting for us, dawdling home from school to keep our appointment. Look, I dumped water over Fanny's head and scrubbed Fanny's back in the bathtub. In a time that seemed a long time ago now, I swear I don't remember seeing his privates and yet of course I must have we never played doctor and yet I had played this rather terrifying game with other boys and Fanny had certainly played with other girls and boys I don't remember that we ever had any curious curiosity concerning each other's bodies at all due to the cunning of that watching moment which knew we were approaching. Fanny loved me too much. We needed each other too much. We were a part of each other, flesh of each other's flesh, which meant that we 
so took each other for granted that we never thought of the flesh. He had legs and I had legs, and that wasn't all we knew, but that was all we used. They brought us up the stairs and down the stairs and always to each other. But that meant that there was never, had never been any occasion for shame between us. I was flat chested for a very long time. I'm only beginning to have real breasts now because of the baby. In fact, and I still don't have any hips. Fanny liked me so much that it didn't occur to him that he loved me. I liked him so much that no other boy was real to me. I didn't see them. I didn't know what this meant. That the waiting moment, which had spied us on the road and which was waiting for us, knew. Fanny kissed me goodnight one night when he was 21 and I 18. And I felt his privates jerk against me and he moved away. I said good night and I ran up the stairs and he ran down the stairs and I couldn't sleep that night. Something had happened and he didn't come around. I didn't see him for two or three weeks. That was when he did that wood figure that he gave to mama. The day he gave it to her was a Saturday. After he gave that figure to mama, we left the house and we walked around. I was so happy to see him after so long. that I was ready to cry and everything was different. I was walking through streets I had never seen before. The facts around me I had never seen. Excuse me, the faces around me I had never seen. We moved in a silence which was music from everywhere. Perhaps for the first time in my life I was happy and I knew that I was happy and Fanny held me by the hand. It was like that Sunday morning so long ago when his mother had carried us to church. Fanny had had no part in his hair now. It was heavy all over his head. He had to be, he had no blue shirt, suit. He had no suit at all. He was wearing an old black and red lumber jacket and old gray corduroy pants. His heavy shoes were scuffed and he smelled of fatigue. He was the most beautiful person I had seen in all my life. He was a slow, long-legged, bow-legged walk. He has a slow, long-legged, bow-legged walk. We walked down the stairs to the subway train, he holding me by the hand. The train, when it came, was crowded, and he put an arm around me for protection. I suddenly looked up into his face. No one can describe this. I really shouldn't try. His face was bigger than the world, his eyes deeper than the sun, more vast than the desert, all that had ever happened since time began was in his face. He smiled a little smile. I saw his teeth. I saw exactly where the missing tooth had been. That day he spat in my mouth. The train rocked. He held me closer in a kind of sigh I'd never heard before stifled itself in him. It's astounding the first time you realize that a stranger has a body. The realization that he has a body makes him a stranger. It means that you have a body too. You will live with this forever and it will spell out the language of your life. And it was absolutely astonishing to me to realize that I was a virgin. I really was. I suddenly wondered how. I wondered why, but it was because I had always, without ever thinking about it, known that I would spend my life with Fanny. It simply had not entered my mind that my life could do anything else. This meant that I was not merely a virgin, I was still a child. We got off the train at Sheridan Square in the village. We walked east along West 4th Street. Since I was Saturday, the streets were crowded, unbalanced with the weight of people. Most of them were young. They had to be young. You could see that, but they didn't seem young to me. They frightened me. I could not then have said why. I thought it was because they knew so much more than me, and they did. But in another way, which I'm only beginning to understand now, they didn't. They had it all together, the walk, the sound, the laughter, the untidy clothes, clothes which were copies of a poverty as un unimaginable for them as theirs was unexpressibly remote for me. 
There were many blacks and white together. It was hard to tell which was the imitation. <coughs> they were so free that they believed in nothing and didn't realize that this illusion was their only truth and that they were doing exactly as they had been told. Fanny looked over at me. It was getting to be between six and seven. You all right? Sure, you. You want to eat down here, or you want to wait till we get back uptown? Or you want to go to the movies, or you want a little wine, or a little pot, or a little beer, or a cup of... <clears throat> coffee. Or just want to walk a little more before you make up your mind. He was grinning, warm and sweet, and pulling a little against my hand and swinging it. I was very happy, but I was uncomfortable, too. I had never been uncomfortable with him before. Let's walk to the park first. I somehow wanted to stay outside a while. Okay. And he still had that funny smile on his face, like something wonderful had just happened to him, and no one in the world knew anything about it yet but him. But he would tell somebody soon, and it would be me. We crossed crowded 6th Avenue, all kinds of people out hunting for Saturday night. But nobody looked at us because we were together and we were both black. Later, when I had to walk these streets alone, it was different. The people were different, and I was certainly no longer a child. Let's go this way, he said, and we started down 6th Avenue toward Bleecker Street. We started down Bleecker, and Fanny st stared for a moment through the big window of the San Remo. There was no one in there that he knew, and the whole place looked tired and discouraged, as though wearily above, about to shave and get dressed for a terrible evening. The people under the weary light were veterans of indescribable wars. We kept walking. The streets were very crowded now. with youngsters, black and white, and cops. Fanny held his head a little higher, and his grip tightened on my hand. There were lots of kids on sidewalks before the crowded coffee shop. A jukebox was, was playing Aretha's That's Life. It was strange. Everyone was in the streets, moving and talking like people do everywhere, and yet none of it seemed to be friendly. There was something hard and frightening about it, the way that something which looks real but isn't can send you s screaming out of your mind. It was like scenes uptown in a way, with the older men and women sitting on the stoops, with small children running up and down the block, cars moving slowly through the Malestrum, the cop car parked on the corner with the two cops in it, other cops swaggering slowly along the sidewalk. It was like scenes uptown, in a way, but with something left out or something put in. I couldn't tell, but it was a scene that frightened me. One had to make one's way carefully here, for all these people were blind. We were jostled, and Fanny put his arm around my shoulder. We passed... Manetta Tavern, crossed Manetta Lane, passed the newspaper stand on the next corner, and crossed diagonally into the park, which seemed to huddle in the shadow of the heavy new buildings of NYU and the high new apartment buildings on the east and the north. We passed the men who had been playing chess in the lamplight for generations, and people walking their dogs, and young men with bright hair and very tight pants, who looked quickly at Fanny and resignedly at me. We sat down on the stone edge of the dry fountain, facing the arch. There were lots of people around us, but I still felt this terrible lack of friendliness. I've slept in this park sometimes, said Fanny. It's not a good idea. He lit a cigarette. You want a cigarette? Now, now, I had wanted to stay outside for a while, but now I wanted to get in, away from these people, out of the park. Why did you sleep in the park? 
it was late. I didn't want to wake up my folks and I didn't have no bread. 